Welcome everyone. Thank you for, for tuning in um, for our presentation on localized hunger research applications of federal data and national open data sets. It really rolls off the tongue. Um, I'm Angelica Gibson. I'm the data director at Hunger Free America. I've been with the organization for over three years now, and I'm the manager of our National Database of Feeding Programs, which Atticus will talk more about later. Uh, and I also um, oversee of our, our research efforts specifically around uh, the federal data and feeding program survey that we'll, we'll talk about today. And I'm Atticus Rains, a DevOps engineer at Hunger Free America. I'm in charge of most of the technical and back end for our national database. So we'll be covering a, a wide range of topics here today. So uh, definitely let me know if any of you guys are more interested in hearing about, uh, you know, more of the federal side or our national database or um, some of the survey work. Uh, feel free to drop in the chat, maybe if there were any specific things that you were hoping to, to learn from this presentation and we can make sure we spend a little bit more time on any topics that people are more interested in. Um, and so with that, I guess, I guess I'll kick it off. So Hunger Free America, we are a nonpartisan national nonprofit group working to enact the policies and programs needed to end domestic hunger. One thing that makes us really different is we don't actually directly distribute food. And you'll see that that's the case for a lot of other hunger organizations. We really, um, or where they're distributing food. We focus more on the policy side of things and um, working with benefits access and really connecting people to the federal programs. And some of the departments that we, we have at the organization, we do a lot of work with advocacy, research and policy, child nutrition, strategic volunteerism. So that's utilizing skilled volunteers for example, having someone with, with coding skills to help maybe with a, a website for a feeding program instead of just serving food. Um, our Food Action Board program that mobilizes individuals who either have in the past or are currently experiencing food insecurity and hunger. And we bring them with us to events so that they can advocate on their own behalf and, and share their experiences since they are the, the true experts of, of hunger. Uh, we also operate a national AmeriCorps VISTA program and our benefits access team helps people connect to SNAP and WIC benefits in New York City. We also operate a nationwide USDA hunger hotline, which is what our data work mainly supports. Um, they use all the different feeding program data that we gather around the country to help callers who are, are you know, reaching out, looking for resources in their communities. Next slide, please. All right, so the first thing I'll talk about is our New York City hunger report. What we do is we take the federal data from the USDA's household food security in the United States report, and we slice and dice that in a few more kind of you know, areas that they don't quite cover. So we look at New York City data specifically we also, uh, in our reports, look at New York State as a whole. And then we have a totally separate report that focuses on the national picture. We uh, look at the borough level at a few different intersections with populations. So food insecurity among children, employed adults, and seniors. And some of that is unique. Usually with the USDA food security report, they'll just maybe have one small statistic on hunger among uh, employed adults, but we can really get into more granular depth at a, a local level by diving a little bit deeper into the data. We use three-year averages for the New York City data just because the sample size gets significantly smaller when you're looking at the county level. So that's something to really keep in mind if you're looking to do um, something similar. And what's really important there is looking at the unweighted number of, of responses as opposed to the total responses because they do um, weight based on population. 
Our latest 2021 report also incorporated data from the Census Pulse Survey. I won't go into that too much because that's opening up a whole other can of worms. Um, but basically, that is a survey that the census really kind of brought about in reaction to COVID. And so that provided current, current data on um, a nearly week by week basis. Uh, that's different from the USDA's report, which is considered the gold standard uh, because it, the USDA's report is publishing data from uh, a year ago. So in the 2021 report, we'll be uh, looking at 2020 year data from the USDA. And so that little bit of a delay is certainly important to keep in mind, especially during these crazy times where, uh, you know, pandemics and such are happening and just the whole hunger picture changes overnight. <laughs> um, also, another thing to note is that that pulse survey data is a different methodology um, from the USDA's. And so those two numbers are not directly comparable. Next slide, please. Um, so part of why I'm even talking about the, the federal uh, data here is just because I feel like there's a lot more that organizations can do with this federal data that they don't realize they actually have the power to, to look at this at a, a local level. And it's, it's a little difficult to figure out. <laughs> so I'll kind of walk you through some of the steps, um, not into too much depth, but just a brief overview so that you can maybe start thinking about some ideas of, of how you can use this federal data for your own purposes. Um, and, you know, Part of this also comes about because when we publish these figures, we get uh, organizations reaching out to us from around the country that are looking for uh, local data in their cities. And, you know, we're more than happy to help uh, pull those numbers for people. But there is a lot to be said for um, knowing your community and being able to play around with the data and have a little bit of a, a deeper understanding of of um, what the data is showing about your, your local area. So the, the first challenge is, is finding the raw data files. <laughs> Those are extremely hard on the census's website. Um, I, I will say sometimes it's easier to just Google. Um, one thing that is worth mentioning is that oftentimes the more specific data sets are tied to larger survey efforts. So, for example, the food security data is part of the um, current population survey, which is a, a much larger survey effort. And you can find that type of information by looking at the methodology section of uh, whatever federal report you're, you're looking at. Uh, and then finding the raw data, you just kind of mix and match. So maybe, you know, current population survey, food security, raw data type that into Google and, and usually that'll um, take you to where you need to go. You can play around with the census's explore data option, but typically that'll be spitting out to you um, data that's not quite at the granular level that is, in my opinion, extremely interesting when you're looking at New York City in, in particular. Uh, technical documentation seems really scary, but it is extremely useful. Um, understanding the variables, figuring out what variable will give you um, the age brackets that you're looking for and, uh, you know, employment status. Um, and one of the best ways to figure that out is by just kind of coming through the really kind of intimidating technical documentation. But um, for, for us, we only actually really use 10 variables out of the hundreds of variables that they explain. So keywords are extremely <laughs> useful um, to, to point you where you need to go. Uh, and also just replicating the national figures that you can find in, in reports like the USDA hunger report, try to replicate those numbers to make sure that your methodology is, is correct. So for example, um, what I would do is pull a uh, you know, try to find out the national number of hungry individuals in the U.S. and make sure that that matches what the USDA is reporting. And that way I can figure out, okay, I grabbed the correct hunger variable. So a, a little bit of trial and error. 
Um, but usually after a couple days of maybe pulling your hair out occasionally, you can, you can oftentimes figure it out. Uh, but one of the really helpful options too is you can email the authors of the reports. We're really lucky that the Economic Research Service uh, within the USDA who publishes the report that we uh, pull a lot of the data from, they're extremely helpful and have answered some of the most basic questions I've asked about variables uh, to more complex questions about various weightings and, and things of that nature. Um, so you never know until you try. <laughs> um, it's always worth giving the, the authors a, an email and see if they can point you in the right direction. Uh, I'd also recommend trying to either get statistical software if you're going to embark on analyzing federal data in this manner. Um, another option, if you don't have the budget for it, is what we did this past year is we partnered with SAS's Data for Good team and they pro bono lended their software and services to help us analyze the data. A lot of times you can find federal data in um, CSV formats. So if you're an Excel whiz, um, that is possible, but uh, I, I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> it's uh, yeah, the Excel spreadsheets are very intimidating. It's uh, a lot easier if you can pull it into to some software. Uh, next slide. And so before I pass it over to Atticus to talk about our national database of um, feeding programs, uh, I just want to make a note that this whole project that Atticus is uh, talking about really started from a New York City database that we were running for uh, the production of our neighborhood guides to food and assistance, which I'll post a link in the chat here uh, in a moment. And then we also use that data for the research purposes of uh, a survey for these feeding programs, which we'll talk about more later. Uh, so, you know, you don't need to operate your own open source national database to be able to um, get some really valuable community surveys like what we'll talk about. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a great initiative if you have the resources. <laughs> and um, another thing to keep in mind is, you know, whatever your focus area is, whether maybe it's hunger or well, hunger, you would look for us, but poverty or something like that. Um, look for other open source databases out there that you can try to leverage for, for some of this uh, other data that isn't federally published. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Angelica. Um, so what you see here is a, a kind of a snapshot of the current state of our database. Uh, as you can tell, it's not quite the uh, 65 to 60,000 uh, estimated emergency feeding programs uh, that operate around the country. Uh, but our, our goal is to collect as many of those as possible while still keeping our data open source and ensuring that it's interoperable and accessible to other databases and researchers. Uh, but really the overarching mission of this project is to help people in need uh, have access to uh, feeding assistance programs uh, near them. And whether that is through our hunger hotline, our texting service, uh, our website, or our partners' websites. This is an example of our website that uses this data. Um, we work really hard to make sure that it's um, easy to use and interactive, so it's not a chore to find uh, food assistance near you, and that is, is open and you know, actually what you need. On the back end, this is all um, powered by uh, open referrals, human service data specification. Uh, this data specification is uh, really designed for uh, re community resource uh, directories and referral systems uh, to easily exchange data and warehouse it in a way that um, really makes sense for this purpose. Um, some things that we've really enjoyed from working with this data sort or data structure is that it's very flexible um, and it, it encapsulates 
almost every edge case that you can imagine. And those that it doesn't, it's very easy to adapt and add on to to cover those. Uh, it's also very well supported and has a very active community, uh, not just in the US, but uh, internationally, uh, especially in the UK, they're doing some really interesting stuff with uh, with HSDS. Um, and lastly, it has an accompanying API spec that uh, we use as the basis for our API, and it makes it really easy to connect with other uh, data sources. Uh, some hurdles that we've run into is that as a result of it being uh, very flexible and, and very robust, it also can be verbose and it can be difficult for smaller uh, data sources with less technical capacity to implement and integrate into our system. Um, but some of the data that we collect, uh, there's two main categories. We collect data on feeding programs those are your food pantry, soup kitchens, uh, senior feeding programs, et cetera. Um, in the future, we're looking to expand this into uh, virtual food pantries and meal delivery services. Um, the second type of uh, data that we collect is uh, data on benefits access and that's mainly uh, SNAP offices, HRA offices, WIC clinics. Uh, but again, we're hoping to expand that into organizations like ours that help people apply for benefits as well. Um, so then how do we collect this data? There, we have three main um, streams. At the very highest level, we have uh, partnerships with other um, data re referral providers and, and large databases that have large amounts of data um, for the entire country. These are great because they, they help us reduce data silos, reduce duplicative work, and it helps us uh, improve accuracy for us and our partners by easily sharing uh, up when we get data updates. Uh, at the next level, we have uh, local and regional anti-hunger organizations. Um, like Angelica mentioned before, this is where really where we got our start, uh, just working with a, a smaller New York City focused data set. So we really know how engaged these organizations are with their communities uh, and how accurate their data can be. Uh, one downside to this though is they have varying levels of uh, technical capacity. Uh, as I mentioned before, you know, some of them have really uh, well-built databases and API access, while others are still managing their data in spreadsheets. Um, and as I mentioned before, that can make it difficult to incorporate their data into our system in, a, in an automated way. But that's something that we're really hoping to improve on and something that we're, we're working towards. Um, and then finally, at the, the very granular level, it's communicating with the services directly. Uh, and obviously this is going to be the most accurate data, uh, but it's also the most work in both for us and the services. You can imagine trying to email or call every food pantry in the country. And likewise, they're receiving emails and calls from so many different uh, maps and databases um, that I think really where we stand out is combining all of these um, data streams into one, you know, integrating all of these large data providers, cross-checking their data with the uh, local and regional organizations, and then filling in the gaps and verifying with the services directly. Um, and so with that, I'm going to pass it back to Angelica to talk about how we use this data in our research. So after we've gotten all of that wonderful data of the different EFPs around the country, um, what we do is we send out a survey so that we can hear about their experiences in the community, um, maybe special nuances of how hunger is showing up, where they're at, uh, learn about whether or not they have enough food to meet demand, and things of that nature. And so what's wonderful about this is it's the perfect complement to the federal data. The federal data is great because it, it provides really um, 
solid metrics that follow a gold standard and it's you know a methodology that's repeated year after year but the survey is able to add a little bit more narrative and, and color to the numbers that we're seeing in the federal data uh, the qualitative data that you can obtain from these surveys is really really rich and oftentimes not only does it help us learn more about what these numbers mean, but it also makes people more interested in the issue if they can connect these numbers to an actual community or person. And so, of course, the first thing we do with our survey is update our database information, um, hours, contact information, all of that. Um, that's partially also how we <laughs> are able to get a lot of responses too, because they, people know that we're we're using the data from the survey for some, you know, really tangible uh, work. But uh, one thing that I would mention for anyone creating a survey, it's a little bit of a pet peeve of mine, but it's also just good practice, is to make sure that all of your questions have a purpose. Uh, a lot of people will draft up surveys with questions that feel like questions they should ask and we should be asking respondents, but they don't actually have an idea of how they want to use that data after it's gathered. And so if you find yourself developing a survey, really look at each question and ask yourself, when I get the answer to this data from the respondents, what exactly do I plan on doing with it? And you know, one thing specifically is a lot of people will just by default include demographic data and that's wonderful data to have, but it can also be a barrier in, in some cases, which I know there have been, there's been a few Open Data Week presentations specifically on that. Um, and so a lot of people will by default include demographic data, but they don't actually have any plan for how to use those demographics in their analyses. So just really comb through your survey questions with a, a fine tooth comb and, and you'll um, thank yourself later for it because it'll boost your responses because people are more willing to respond to a survey that's a bit shorter. Uh, and also that's asking good questions that seem like they can actually, it's providing good data as opposed to just wasting their time answering a bunch of questions that might not even really be used for anything. Another benefit of survey data is that this is more current. So as we mentioned, the federal data especially in the case of the USDA federal report, there's the, the year lag. And so the survey data allows us to um, report on numbers and metrics and information that's more current. And so I'll share with you guys a, a link to our 2019 report, just because the pre-pandemic uh, report uh, is a little bit more of a stronger <laughs> Um, example of the, the breadth of ways that you can use this data, combining federal and serving qualitative data. Um, just because when the pandemic hit, our 2020 survey or 2020 report focused more on survey responses because the 2019 federal data wasn't particularly relevant because the hunger picture had totally changed when, when the pandemic hit. And then um, our 2021 report we finally had pandemic era uh, federal data, and we also had the uh, pulse survey data, which I mentioned before, but that led to some kind of interesting and, and different analyses to try to compare what the actual 2021 um, numbers and, and hunger picture looked like. So this 2019 report, I would say, is the more representative report of how we would usually present data and findings, but feel free to peruse our, our more current um, reports. Uh, another thing that's really beneficial with surveys is you can answer more questions that are specific to the impacts of policy. So for example, in 2019, we asked a question about public charge, which the Trump administration proposed a change to public charge uh, I'm not going to go too into the weeds with that, but basically a lot of people were uh, afraid of um, the receiving SNAP and federal benefits uh, because of how it interacted with their um, citizenship status. 
but all the confusion surrounding that also impacted the, the feeding programs. And so by asking in the survey the impacts that these feeding programs noticed from public charge, we got some really interesting data that we would not have known otherwise. So for example, there was one food pantry that there supposedly was a, a rumor going around that ICE was monitoring their pantry site, um, which was not true, but just everything with public charge created so much confusion that these rumors were, were coming up. And so there was really no one visiting this food pantry, even though there was nothing wrong. And it's those types of stories that we wouldn't really know otherwise. And we were one of the few organizations that really learned about the impacts it was having on the community because we, we asked about it. Uh, another way that we've used it more recently is asking the feeding programs how increases in, in SNAP and, and federal aid have influenced their demand. And so it's, it's a good way to get a sense of how policy discussions and um, the, the moves that the government makes impacts the community themselves. Next slide. So here, here are a few quotes. I think this is my favorite part of the report, just because it's the area where um, pantries and kitchens can really just talk about what they're seeing. And, you know, you'll notice a couple themes here about uh, employment and um, citizenship status of Atonement Lutheran Church. They're talking about, you know, how an influx of, of funding because of the pandemic was great, but then over time that funding ran out. And so now they're feeding these pandemic level of, uh, of individuals with pre-pandemic funding. And that is a very common story that we saw through um, some of these quotes that we gathered from feeding programs. Uh, also limitations of grants. It raises some great questions about um, how restricting grant funds and the usage of them sometimes can not allow these feeding programs to actually get some of the supplies that they need. Uh, and, you know, of course, this last quote here is talking about how much the, the increase in food prices has been impacting the demand that they're seeing in the pantry and kitchen, which is certainly something we're continuing to look at as, you know, inflation continues. Next slide. So these are just a couple policy recommendations. If you look at our reports, you'll see a long list of policy recommendations. Uh, I just pulled out a couple that felt relevant to um, specifically feeding programs and some of what we've talked about. Sorry about my dog kind of jumping into the meeting here. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, you know, feel free to look at our lengthier policy recommendations, but, um, you know, a few things that's just really important to note is you analyze this federal data and then you supplement it with uh, survey data or data that just in general you're collecting um, from the community. And then after analyzing it, you can come up with a set of strong policy recommendations and turn this into actionable steps uh, and, and really put the data to use. And so, you know, one example is this food access index um, that's talking about food prices. And um, the last one here, minimum wage. For the national report that we create, what's been really interesting is we'll pull uh, the hunger levels of employed adults and then compare that to the state minimum wages. And then we can see how the relationship between minimum wage and hunger among employed adults, um, you know, whether or not there's a correlation there. <clears throat> of course, there's a lot of different factors involved in, in hunger, um, but, uh, you know, it can start to lead us to some interesting questions and, and start a discussion. Next slide. All right. So, I mean, we left plenty of time for questions because we, we covered a wide variety of things here. Um, we're more than happy to, uh, you know, answer any specific questions that you guys have. Um, feel free to drop in the chat uh, anything that um, questions you have or things you'd like to learn more about. Um, also, you can, I think, raise your hand with Zoom. We can unmute you and you can ask your question. And then, of course, you can always email us and, and reach out. Yeah, thank you for that question, Stephen. Um, so the question is, who or what groups um, use our information that we produce in the reports? 
uh, actually quite a <laughs> quite a few different um, groups and stakeholders. Our, our reports get a lot of media attention. And so, um, especially around Thanksgiving, sometimes those numbers about hunger that you see, sometimes that's coming from our report, especially at the, the city level. Um, and then also for the national report, we sometimes make uh, more local news in, in those other cities around the country. And then our reports are also um, used by various elected officials. Um, and we've had a, a number of elected officials kind of speak during our, our data or report launches um, and uh, various other hunger groups throughout the city too. We've had um, you know, some collaboration with uh, Food Bank and City Harvest um, and they conduct kind of similar surveys of feeding programs. And so we kind of compare and contrast uh, what we're all seeing um, and yeah, those are the main groups. Let's see, we have a hand raised. I think you should be on mute now. Hey. Oh, can you hear me? Yep. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Aldo, I'm an epidemiologist. I work at the New York City Health Department. Uh, thank you so much for presenting this data. This is, this is really interesting. It's very much in line with um, Kind of work we're we're doing here. Um, th this is in the city health department. There's there's more focus coming into uh, or being given to food insecurity, and so uh, we're trying to incorporate some measures of food insecurity into our health surveys, um, knowing that there's always a limited amount of space, but but um, underst understanding the importance of it, especially as a, a determinant of health. Um, I'm wondering what, and it, this might be a, maybe a little bit too broad of a question, but um, what kind of uh, data would you like to see coming from, from the city uh, specifically? I mean, knowing the capacity that you guys already have, but um, are there, uh, it, any uh, either survey data or any other sort of data that, that um, you would like to see coming from the city um, or, I mean, the health department specific, but you know, I'm interested to hear uh, your thoughts on that. Yeah, great question, thank you. Um, so specific to the health department, there's a lot of active discussion around um, yeah, hunger and food security and social determinants of health. Uh, and I think there's a lot of questions about how we can better integrate uh, food security screenings with uh, patients and, and help pe link people up who, who are food insecure with the resources in the city. So in terms of data, um, I mean, I, I would actually love to have more of a lengthier conversation about this because I, I think there is a lot of opportunity and, and part of the way that we've built the national database is to uh, also bridge that gap um, of healthcare providers, the patients they're seeing and access to these resources. Um, so I, I can't think of a specific, you know, data ask that I would, kind of set of data that I'd like to see from the health department. The city had a whole um, more public data about uh, feeding programs and uh, especially those that are receiving um, federal and government funding um, and the, uh, the statuses and hours and information on those programs. Um, that's been our biggest challenge with the national database of feeding programs is this is vital information for a lot of people around the country, but nobody's really doing a great job of tracking it, especially because these hours change very regularly with, um, you know, they're operated by volunteers who are doing this part-time. Uh, sometimes someone has to call out sick and then there's, you know, no um, pantry that week or whatever. Um, so that that would be, uh, that's, a, that's a big, um, thing that I would like to see. Atticus, do you, do you have anything that comes to mind? Um, you know, I can't think of a data point off, off the top of my head right now, but I think it would, it would be great if you emailed us and we I would love to have a, a longer discussion about this. Hi there. Um, <clears throat> hey, Joe, Atticus. Uh, my name is Jim Wengler from Hunger Free America. I thought I would just um, 
add a little bit to that question, Aldo. And Angelica, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think, you know, one of the things we collect from the Department of Health are WIC offices, right? So, uh, you know, that that's one of the sections in the, um, in the database and in those guides that we produce as well. So I don't know exactly the process now, but I, I don't think um, we have a single contact at the Department of Health that can give us all of the updated um, information on the WIC offices, uh, the hours, et cetera, especially as things change. So I just thought I would add that. I think that would be one something that could potentially be really helpful if, if we don't already have that relationship in place. Yeah, thank you for chiming in there, Jim. That sure. uh, is a huge, huge need. We told we you I'd be watching. Yeah. <laughs> um, we uh, do not have a good, uh, reliable source for WIC data, really anywhere in the country, <laughs> um, in terms of receiving regular updates. It's really just a lot of online searches in various places and then calling to confirm that the information is correct. Thank you guys for the answer. I would, yeah, I would certainly love to talk to you guys a little bit more at length. And I didn't mean to put you on the spot with a specific question, but I did. Um, I, I would be open to, or I would like to have a, a longer conversation. Thank you. Clyde, I think you should be on mute now. Uh, good afternoon. How are you doing? Uh, I just want to say thank you for the presentation. Um, I, I work here at NYCHA, and uh, my question is pretty much, I know you all do a lot of uh, collection of data of uh, hunger indexes and how uh, hunger is spread out throughout cities. Uh, and I was kind of... <clears throat> Oh, excuse me, I was kind of wondering at what scale do you see uh, certain food programs being most effective? Uh, because here at NYCHA, we um, obviously span all of New York City and the biggest housing uh, corporation in, in the country, but uh, we have some buildings or some developments which can be a building or two, and we also have some developments which can be around 100 buildings. Um, so when you all look at collecting your hunger data, um, and looking at solutions to, okay, like uh, this is a location in a neighborhood which can be uh, utilized and that the neighborhood depends on. I was kind of wondering what scale uh, do you see uh, these hunger solutions being most effective at? Is it a neighborhood scale? Is it a uh, kind of a city district scale or is it more of an entire citywide kind of scale? Yeah, great question. I mean, definitely the first thing to mention, uh, the SNAP program is unbelievably <laughs> far more effective than um, charitable uh, feeding programs. That is the best way to, um, you know, really help food insecure individuals. And so we actually do a lot of re uh, outreach around the, the NYCHA areas, um, specifically for SNAP benefit application assistance and, and things of that nature. Um, Emergency feed, feeding programs are, are great, especially in situations like the, the pandemic when, you know, people need it, uh, need food assistance immediately. Um, but, you know, the SNAP and WIC are, are definitely the direction I would point people towards. Um, and that in terms of like the most effective level, I mean, there's a lot of work that can be done at every level, really. Uh, and you'll notice in our policy recommend recommendations section, uh, especially for the most recent report, which I can, I'll post a link to that as well for the 2021 report, but we break it down by um, national recommendations, uh, New York state wide recommendations, and then New York City specifically, um, those recommendations. But there's a lot of work that can be done too at the, the borough level. Um, it's really just uh, building the political will to, to end hunger and, you know, look at uh, long lasting solutions for it. Um, and yeah, Jim, feel free to chime in too if you have any <laughs> specific answers to that uh, question. But. Sorry there, Joe. I, I had to step away for a second. So I, I was not um, present for most of that previous back and forth. Apologies. No, no problem, Jim. <laughs> um, I think I think we answered your question, right, Clyde? And I'll also send the 2021 report here so you can see those recommendations broken down by the, the ge geographic region. All right, so I see we have another question here from Dan. Um, any preferred metrics you often see to gauge program effectiveness? Um, 
This, this gets to be a really interesting question when we're looking at feeding program data, because you'll see a lot of metrics about um, the number of people served, uh, the number of meals served, and then the um, like pounds of food that's, that's been distributed by these programs. Um, in general, those questions can be, or th those metrics can be um, a little, a little misleading and sometimes the uh, poundage, that's not necessarily the best way to, to measure, um, you know, the effectiveness of really ending hunger in a community. Um, I, I would say preferred metrics, I think, um, hmm. I don't know. I actually, I, I'm not sure I have an immediate answer to that question. <laughs> um, but now you have me thinking. <laughs> I know what metrics are, are not uh, extraordinarily helpful. I mean, what, what is also helpful is uh, number of people enrolled in SNAP versus uh, SNAP eligibility um, levels. That's a great way to see who, like with SNAP program enrollment, similar with WIC. Um, yeah. Um, so Dan asked again, any you see often asked from grant programs or organizations? Yeah, I mean, those metrics, especially for, um, uh, at the organization level, a lot of those um, feeding charities that we mentioned, they do report on a uh, number of people and, and meals and, and poundage served um, of food. So those are those are the typical metrics that are asked. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I'm blanking a little bit on what the preferred ones would be. <laughs> I just know the um, errors in the data more so. <laughs> All right, any last minute burning questions people want to ask? Give it another few seconds. Um, but otherwise, like I mentioned, please do feel free to reach out to us. Um, we love talking about data and starting conversations. So uh, yeah, shoot us an email and, and you know, we'd love to, to discuss further. Thanks, everyone. Bye.